sure I'm on here. Yep, there we go. You might be wondering, why do we have a bunch of people sitting on stage? And why does it look like a classroom? Well, one of the things that we love to do here at Grace is we have a class that we have called C3. And I'm really excited because this week, rather than C3 meeting next door, we are going to be doing our C3 discussion as part of our church service. So you as part of the congregation are going to get an opportunity to participate in C3 even during church service. And for those of you who are online, during the 9 a.m. service, you guys had your own little conversation going on through Facebook. Keep, go, keep that going. If you have thoughts, feel free to share online. Well, I want to let you know why we're doing this. See, as a church, one of the things that uh, attracted me to Grace, uh, attracted both Shar and myself to Grace, was that we are a church that prioritizes the Word of God. And by that, you will hear sermons that go word for word through different books of the Bible. We just finished the Philippians study. But we want to do more than just simply do that from the pulpit. We want to be able to, or we are a church that's committed to teaching people how to think biblically. And so around the time I started coming here, about seven years ago, we started teaching a class called Christianity, Culture, and Conversation. And you may have heard announcements from week to week about this, and every time we make announcements, it comes out different. It's like Christianity, conversation. No, it's Christianity, culture, and conversation. And this is a class where we talk about the issues that are going on in our world, but we do it from a biblical perspective. Now, unlike most classes that you think of, it's not the teacher just sitting up front writing on a whiteboard, though I will be doing that. Um, it's a discussion. And so when you come to C3, you get an opportunity to engage in a discussion uh, about whatever topics we're dealing with. And uh, before we get to some of, the, some of the frequently asked questions and stuff, I want to introduce, we have a panel today uh, of people who have been some of our regulars for C3. And I want to introduce, my, introduce our panel uh, today. So I want to start over here. We want to start with Kelly Worrell. Kelly is a professor at Moody, and she's also one of the heads of the English department at Moody. Uh, if you've ever had a privilege of being part of our conferences, she and Peter speak at our conferences. Um, it brings such thoughtfulness to the things that she says, but also such incredible humility. I don't know how you balance the two really well, but um, anytime you get a chance to listen to Kelly speak, I would highly encourage that. She's also an accomplished author as well. Then we have Ivan Grunthal, and if you haven't had a chance to talk to Ivan, you have missed out. Um, perhaps the most important thing I can say about Ivan is that... Uh, he rode his bike 84 miles yesterday. 84 miles. Just to go to church? <laughs> Dedication. I'll tell you, my foot would cramp up driving in a car 84 miles. Um, but no, Ivan, uh, another very thoughtful person who speaks so eloquently and brings such great perspective. He also brings some Latino flavor to our C3 discussions, as well as bringing, brings a military perspective. Um, and a number of our conversations that, that we, you know, the military is part of those discussions and I love his perspective. And to my right, we have Kathy Bryant. Yeah, yeah. Kathy Bryant brings, uh, I'll tell you, I, almost every C3 discussion, she's sending me memes and, and articles and you know, she wants to keep the conversation going. Another very thoughtful person, but one of the unique things that Kathy brings is an empathy and an awareness of the group. So there will be a weekly basis. She'll be like, that person's raising their hand, or they're trying to. But you, you. So she, she's aware of what's going on and brings, and brings compassion and reminds us that we're dealing with people. Because sometimes when you talk ideas, you can forget that people are involved in that. So I love having Kathy's perspective on this as well. Oh, and she also heads up our, our women's ministry as well. So, you know, she's got that going for her too. Now, I know we're not supposed to have favorites as a teacher. But to my left is my favorite, my, my lovely wife, Charmaine. Um, yeah, that's right. <laughs> um, Charmaine brings a lot of amazing perspectives. Uh, and uh, full disclosure, over half of my C3 topics, I get them from her. <laughs> she's listening to podcasts, engaging on things, looking at Facebook and other things, and she's like, this is a great topic. And the topic we're going to discuss today, it was her idea. So if you like the topic, you know, give her credit. But Char also brings uh, some unique perspectives, not only just as a thoughtful person, but also as a nurse. And as we've been talking about a lot of COVID things lately in, in one way or another, love hearing Char's perspective as a nurse on those topics. 
And then we have John Skinner, who I have dubbed the most passionate person in C3. Every week, John, John, John doesn't just discuss ideas detached. No, John cares about them. And, I, and a couple weeks ago, or probably about a month or so ago, I don't even remember, when we were talking about Black Lives Matter, John said, hey, before we get into this discussion, can we take a moment here and remember that a man died? And if we're going to talk about this and not discuss this man who died, then, then we're, we're not doing justice to this topic. And John always brings great passion, but he's also very thoughtful. He, he comes with a journalism minor, which means that he, analyzing sources is a big part of C3 and thinking about and, and being critical of sources. He helps bring that to us. So i uh, really excited to have this panel. And then, of course, you as the congregation are also part of the panel as well. We're going to be including that. We have our own Pastor Mike, um, who's going to be going around with a clean microphone that he will be wiping in between discussions to make sure that we are as safe as possible. That's right. Um, so before we get to our topic, I want to talk a little bit more about what C3 is. So we have some, um, we have some things up here I want to show you. First, frequently asked questions. What do we do at C3? Well, the simple answer is we talk or we listen, hopefully listening as much as we're talking, but it's a discussion. We sit in a circle or semi-circle like this and we talk about issues and we try to do it from a biblical perspective. And my number one goal is to create an environment that is safe for people from different perspectives to be able to offer their opinions. Is, why is this worth my time? Well, in this day and age when everybody, is, everybody wants to express their opinion, we have all seen that many people don't do this well. And so to have an environment which teaches you how to talk to people of diverse opinions and how to subject all of that to scripture, it's an incredible, um, it's an incredible tool and a skill to learn. And I think every one of you should learn that. It's good. I, I, I know I needed to learn that, and it's been, been quite a blessing. Now, is this class only for Democrats or Republicans? Because the reality is, let's be honest, a lot of the stuff that's going on is political. Well, here's the answer. Yes, it's for anybody. It's for Democrats, for Republicans, for moderates, for liberal, whatever you want to say. It is for any political affiliation or any particular set of ideas. It is a safe environment where you can come with diverse ideas and we will respect each other and we will learn from each other. So we have, we have some people at C3 who are hardcore Republicans. We have some people who are hardcore Democrats. And you know what? We love each other through it, and we, learn, and we learn to subject it all to Christ. Well, another question. What do I do with my family? I mean, if I'm going to sit in this discussion, what do I do with my family during this time? Well, if you have little, little ones like Shar and I do, you have them go to Grace Kids for both services. You, have them, you, you come to the 9 o'clock service, do what you're doing, and then at, during the 11 o'clock service when you're at C3, have them go to Grace Kids. A little bit of a teacher secret. Kids need to hear things multiple times before it really sinks in. I, I've learned that with my students. And so you can drop off your, your, your little ones for both services. The other option is if your kids are a little bit older, why not let now be a time when they start getting involved in serving at church? We will find ways. If you have elementary school going into junior high, we will find ways to get them involved in the service. Come and talk to us. We would love to allow them to start learning how to serve even at such a young age. Well, am I going to get pressured to speak if I go to C3? Every week we have people who come to listen. They don't need to speak. They don't want to speak. They want to absorb. And I know some of you take time to process. We're not going to pressure you. But if we see that you look like you want to speak, we might just say, hey, do you have a thought? You could feel free to say no. We're not going to pressure you. And finally, what subjects do we cover in C3? Well, our next slide is going to give you some suggestions, uh, some of the topics we've covered in the past year. Around the time of the Super Bowl, if you remember with Shakira and J-Lo, there was a lot of discussion about female empowerment. So we talked about that. Is that a good thing? Is that a bad thing? What is appropriate joking? Right? What, what, where do I draw the line? Is sarcasm okay? You know, for some of us, sarcasm is a sixth love language, so how do we deal with that, right? <laughs> black Lives Matter. We had a number of discussions on Black Lives Matter. We talked about it and said, what should we think as a Christian? Are we sinning if we're not healthy? A lot of people left that discussion feeling a little bit guilty, but uh, no, it was a good discussion. We talked about, you know, what, do we have to be healthy? Is it ever okay to tell a lie? Um, is there a connection between spiritual warfare and mental illness? 
Uh, what, how do we understand generational dif differences? This was one of my favorite discussions we had years ago, where we had people from the boomers and different generations discussing, hey, how do we work? Do we get offended too easily? And some of you in this discussion might get offended. Do we get offended too easily? Women's roles in the church. What does scripture say on this topic? And how should we respond to the LGBTQ plus movement? These are just a few of the many discussions we have. And if these kind of discussions sound interesting to you, I would encourage you to make it a priority to come to the 9 o'clock service and then and come next door for our C3 discussions during the 11 o'clock service. Well, before we get to our discussion, I have one final thing that we're going to do. You see, every once in a while, we have a fallacy of the week, a logical fallacy of the week. And so, giving credit where credit is due, our own Kathy Bryant sent this meme to me this week, and I thought, we got to find this, find a way to get this in here. So, offensive foul, false dichotomy. Here's, what, here's the fallacy of a false dichotomy. When you create a situation to look like there's only two options, when there's actually more than two. So, for example, you, you, you hear this all the time. One of the things in, in, out in the news, well, if you are against abortion, that means you only love people in the womb and you don't love them out of the womb. If, you, if you're against abortion, you're, you, you're also against supporting people after they're born. That's a false dichotomy. Similarly, if you're pro-abortion, that means you hate people. No, these are, false, these are false dichotomies. There are more than two options out there. And a lot of times in discussions, we, we, you set up something where there's only two options, and a person's sitting in the back saying, well, neither of those two describe my view. That's a false dichotomy. Well, with that being said, we're going to get to our topic for today. And the topic we have chosen for today is the topic of censorship. Um, and I have a few, uh, few slides for this topic of censorship. This was this week. An economics professor says the right state won't let him open class critical to Marxism to all students. So in this article, you have a professor, a tenured professor, wanted to open up this class, and they said, nope, only to honor students. He was censored. They limited his ability to teach this class to everyone. Or this next one, kindergarten cop. If you remember that movie with Arnold, it was pulled from the Portland theater after complaints that it romanticizes over-policing. <laughs> so they took it down. They censored it. They said, you can't watch, we're not going to let you show this movie, Kindergarten Cop. And then maybe this next one, some of you have seen this on your own Facebook feed. We removed something you posted because it didn't follow the Facebook community standards. A few weeks ago, there was, some of, there was a post that many of you guys posted about COVID, and it kept on getting taken down. And before long, the discussion wasn't about the video. It was about Facebook taking down things. So with all that being said, today we're going to talk about censorship. And there are some questions we're going to discuss, and I'm going to open it up to the panel, and then I'll let you know when you guys can get involved as well. So let's start with defining things. What is the definition of censorship? <laughs> a basic definition that we can start with, I think, is when an entity of authority suppresses speech uh, because it is deemed to be harmful or uh, false or inconvenient or, you know, they put those restrictions on certain elements of speech. Okay, so a person of authority, it's done by someone in authority, and it's, and it's limiting information or taking it away because it's deemed to be harmful or false. Anything else you guys would like to add to that? I'm trying to remember what we did in the last service. <laughs> this is a brand new conversation. We don't have to do what we did last service. I have notes. Um, <laughs> Just to point out, this is a, a, one of my favorite topics. So, uh, although the First Amendment applies only to state actors, meaning those affiliated with the federal government, federal and state government authorities, uh, there's a common misconception that it prohibits anyone from limiting free speech, including private non-government entities. So, to Kelly's point, we talk about those in authority. It's, uh, it goes back to the First Amendment of the U.S. Constitution, which was designed to restrain government specifically. Yeah. So censorship is actually allowed to some extent under our Constitution. It is not necessarily a violation of First Amendment rights unless it's the government doing it. The government doesn't have the power, but individuals do. All right, John? And the one thing I wanted to say is, you know, we're, we're discussing a lot of different concepts here, and we're calling it all censorship. Per, and I'm fine with that for this conversation, but 
personally, like those examples you showed, I would consider the first two censorship, but then Facebook, uh, I would, what they did, I would consider that content moderation. And I think that's part of this conversation is deciding what is appropriate uh, you know, content moderation. And censorship has a really negative connotation, but, uh, and so sometimes it may sound bad the rest of this conversation if I say, oh, I'm, I'm for this or there's benefits. But to me, it's, I think we're kind of using it as a, as a catch-all for a lot of terms. Um, mm -hmm. And part of that is private companies moderating the discourse on their platform. Yeah, so the idea is there's the bigger umbrella called content modification, or what's the word? Moderation, I don't know, not modification, but they might do that too. Content moderation, whatever you're observing, if you're in any company, they will moderate that content. But that, so under that umbrella, you also have censorship. So censorship is a type of content moderation, but it goes a little bit broader. And so one of the questions is, how do we distinguish between what is censorship and what is simply content moderation? And I'll throw that out to you guys. How would you guys make that distinction between the two? I think that goes back to some of the definitions that we were talking about with Kelly saying it's for protection. What is the motivation in that? Is the motivation to limit information so that you have more control or is the motivation for the censorship public health, public good? Um, I know that Ivan had talked about this idea of the military and we had talked, or you, you know the phrase, loose lips sink ships, right? Mm -hmm. So we were called we, as if I was alive in, in World War II, but you know, we were, Americans were called in that time to really guard their speech for the protection of our nation. So I think it goes back to motivation. Am I trying to control the narrative for the sake of my own benefit or for the sake of the people at large? Okay, I like that. Yeah, it's, it's hard because like I, I, like I brought up a definition of censorship and it, oops, like it can go along with exactly what, what you were saying, John, is that it's a, sorry, my phone's on the fritz, but hmm. just it's the suppression of any part of movies or books or news um, based on uh, whether it's offensive or harmful. And yeah. it's like, the only, I feel like censorship, like you said, censorship feels very like kind of attacking almost. And then information moder moderation. Yeah. It's like a nicer way of saying censorship. So, I mean, I don't, I don't necessarily see a difference. I can see motives. Um, yeah, I don't know. It's difficult for me just based on the definition that I looked up. And, so. Yeah, absolutely. And, and all I would say is I think also there's a, a level, of, a degree of uh, intensity. So I think for censorship, it's, it has the effect of effectively silencing a viewpoint overall, um, whereas content moderation would just be you can't, sh you can't sell this book in this bookstore type of thing. And so I think that there's a difference. It's, it's also the ability of the voice to get out matters as well. So like Hollywood movies, when they censored them back yeah. in the day, um, that was censorship because it was implied to the entire uh, you know, industry. So I think there's, yeah. there's a, it's a question of where that line is, but I think for me that's also how intense it is and, and whether someone has the ability to speak somewhere. Yeah, and I'll speak to that and we'll get to our next question after this because we have five questions and we want to get through them. Um, one of the things you learn in public discussion is uh, words can be powerful. Words can have an impact. And so you use words like, for example, to take a political issue. Instead of saying pro-abortion, you say pro-choice. And instead of saying anti-choice, you say anti-abortion. And there's reasons why you use the language you do, because the language itself creates a negative view in someone's mind. So when you're attacking somebody's view, you might use more inflammatory speech you know, so you might say to somebody, if you think what they're doing is censorship, oh, that's censorship. They're like, no, it's just content, modif or content moderation. And so the, the battle over words is something that often happens in a lot of these kind of discussions. So in light of that, as we're wrestling with definitions, what are the benefits of censorship? I would say one of the benefits is, for example, um, you know, the federal government has the right to censor conduct that, let's say, intimidates, harasses, or threatens another person, even if words are used. 
For example, threatening phone calls uh, are not constitutionally protected. Uh, child pornography is not constitutionally protected. Obscene material, this is, I did a lot of research on the FCC website last night talking about censorship. Obscene material is banned by the FCC from public broadcasting at any time. Uh, inappropriate material is banned between 6 a.m. and 10 p.m. when children are likely to be in the audience. So an advantage, of course, is uh, you know, of course, protecting children and such. And finally, to your point earlier, it's a big one for me, which I learned, of course, in the military, is that uh, anything that could potentially uh, provide a clear and present danger, material damage to the United States, uh, communicating troop movements, uh, there's an advantage in censoring that information because otherwise, uh, the public dissemination of that information could put us at severe risk uh, to our enemies. So. Yeah. Good for God. Just another historical example. Uh, I wasn't aware of this, or had, didn't remember it, but not long after the printing press was invented, the church actually put some pretty strict restrictions in place about what books could be published, and they had to go through and get approval from Rome before they could be published. So there's a long history even of the church stepping in and doing some form of censorship. Um, and this is not quite to this question, but I, it also makes me think of, you know, as we think about censorship, how much of our thinking about it is American and how much mm -hmm. of our thinking about it is biblical. And mm -hmm. we place, as Americans, such a high, high value on freedom and free speech and the ability, you know, we don't want anyone to restrict what we do. Uh, and yet scripture puts some pretty clear parameters on what we ought to do. And so trying to navigate, you know, what part of my thinking on this is just cultural, and what part is truly biblical, I think is important. Yeah. Anything else? By the way, this is the part where I'm gonna open it up to you as members of the congregation. So, um, what, what are some things that you think are benefits? And while, while you're thinking, Kathy's going to speak. As, um, mm -hmm. as yeah, you guys and are Just thinking. raise your hand, by the way, raise your hand, sorry to cut you off. Raise okay. your hand if you want to say something, yeah. Shar, would you make your point about um, what you censor with Anthony and why that's good? Yeah, so as I was thinking about what the benefits of censorship are, one of the things um, that me and Johnny do as parents is we censor what Anthony sees or even what he listens to. Um, one of the things that we're actually working on right now with him is hitting. And not hitting. <laughs> We're working on him not hitting. Well, <laughs> yes, not hitting. <laughs> but I, a thought came to me, and I was like, because he's he's watched some cartoons and stuff, and I'm like, I'm wondering if he's seeing hitting in with the characters, because I mean, I'm not hitting Johnny. Johnny's definitely not hitting me, and so. <laughs> <laughs> Where is he picking this up from? Yes, I know sin nature and all that, but um, a lot of what we learn is what we see and hear. And so protecting him from those negative effects is one of, one of the positives of censorship. Yeah. So how about you guys? In, in, oh, we have, one, we have a hand in the back. We have, we have Mike, Mike, and Mike. We have a microphone between Pastor Mike and then Mike McFarland. So, um, um, so specifically thinking within the realm of something like Facebook where we're talking about that, one of the things that comes to mind is that we all come into it with either an explicit or an implicit social contract that we're believing that everybody that's on there is, is a good faith actor. And the moment that somebody comes into there and breaks that social contract and they come in with ulterior motives and they may be coming in to stir up trouble or to, for whatever reason, that's against that social contract, could be a, an opportunity for that censorship or moderation, whatever word you want to come in to kind of restore that social contract. Yeah. So some people, there are trolls, right? We talk about internet trolls. There are people who intend to harm. So this is a way of protecting from those who are not going to respect the contract. Yeah, very good. All right, for the sake of time, I want to move to dangers. Uh, dangers of censorship. So what are, what are some of the dangers of censorship? What can go wrong with censorship? I think this one is a lot easier to answer for us than, uh, than the converse of this. But um, I think the danger becomes when you don't have all opinions on the table, you don't have all options laid out, there is uh, the inability to interact with information in a way that is productive, right? 
we're told how to think because this viewpoint is popularized. And um, once that viewpoint becomes popularized, uh, everybody else does the job of punishing the one who's the outlier, right? So it becomes um, effectively a informational lynch mob to attack mm -hmm. this person who thinks outside of the parameters of how we're told to think. Informational lynch mob, she's gonna trademark that phrase? <laughs> that's a band name, Doug. Uh, <laughs> I really like that, that's, that's, that's memorable, Kathy. Lynch mob, I love it. So for me, uh, one of the big disadvantages of censorship, of course, is it can give preferential treatment to a majority position and thus result in oppressing or opposing minority points of view. It puts too much power in the hands of too few people, and of course it goes against the very fabric and foundation of a free society. It can be very harmful. I shared earlier in the earlier service, um, there's a certain book which has been censored in all public schools in the United States. It happened in 1963. Does anyone know what that book is? The B-I-B-L-E, that's right. Um, censored, by the way, by government authorities. Um, we talk about, uh, for example, John brought up the point of moderators I shared. Um, so I, a few years back, I had the privilege of spending some time at Facebook headquarters in California and Google headquarters of my company because we were big advertisers with them. And I discovered Facebook has between 15 and 20,000 moderators, of whom probably the average age is about 25. It's, that's a fact. And they're the ones moderating content, which of course, for me, was a big eye-opener. Um, but just a fun fact, I was doing some research on how often the federal government has censored and some of the disadvantages, so just a little fun fact. In 1798, during the French and Indian War, Congress passed the Alien and Sedition Act. Has anyone ever heard of that? Alien and Sedition Act, right? <laughs> so it made it a crime for anyone to publish, quote, any false, scandalous, and malicious writing against the government. It was used by the then dominant Federalist Party to prosecute prominent Republican newspaper editors during the late 18th century. And history is replete with more examples of that. So again, disadvantage at suppressing free speech in the public, in the public realm. Um, and I can also speak to, like, it, the church has done that very much so as well with, um, for a while the church the leaders were the only ones that had scripture within their hands and the common person did not have um, scripture. So they, they were keeping people under their thumb and claiming that they had the authority. Um, so that's an, uh, not non-government, but a, a sin of the church. Mm -hmm. But um, I have a pertinent passage for you, Johnny. What? <laughs> um, so, uh, in Proverbs chapter 18, verse 17, the verse that kind of kept popping up in my mind as I was thinking about this topic was, so the one who states his case first seems right until the other comes and examines him. And I think what happens with censor censorship is that when the information is taken down, there's not an opportunity for other voices to, um, to combat that wrong information. And I think often arguing against a certain point of view is not even necessarily for the person who's posting or putting that point of view out there, because I think more often than that, they're already really set in their viewpoint. But it, it's for the onlookers. It's the people that are not quite sure what they think yet. And so allowing that information to be out there um, and then having someone combat that can actually influence a lot of people. And it can actually, to your point, Mike, combat bad motives. You can reveal those bad motives when someone is examining not just your argument, but why you're putting this argument out there in the first place. Yeah, an argument that is not true or is not solid will usually fall to scrutiny if it's done well. So you're given that opportunity. Yeah, what are other some, by the way, this is also open to you as the congregation, so if you have a thought, feel free to raise your hand, and our own Pastor Mike will uh, allow you to speak as well. I was just gonna say, to that point, it highlights the importance of teaching our children and the next generation to think critically, mm -hmm. to know how to weigh up an argument, to know how to engage with the source, to know how to evaluate that source for truth, and uh, I think culturally, Maybe we aren't as good at that as we ought to be and need to be. And I think in this information age, 
when we come across so much content on a daily basis and there aren't the same gatekeepers over that content as historically there may have been, it all looks equal, right? Like you're scrolling your Facebook feed and everything comes equally, it has equal weight. And are we teaching, are we ourselves, I guess, weighing those things up? And then also are we teaching the next generation to engage with it in a thoughtful way, critical way? Yeah, I mean, just going off that point, it, it used to be that like, if you were in New York City, um, different viewpoints had different newspapers or, or, or sources. So you would go to a newsstand and you'd have the New York Times. If you're liberal, mm -hmm. you'd have the New York Post. If you're working class, you have uh, Wall Street Journal. If you're you know, a business person, right wing, and, and uh, Daily News. Like you have all these different perspectives in each of them. And then now kind of the environment we're in is all of those get flattened and then you also have like other sources so you could you know the, the joke that i told before was you have new york times new york post and then you have like the roswell daily alien news update <laughs> you know <laughs> next door and then like the russia sputnik you know russian state propaganda or whatever like all these things you can think of they're all flattened and treated exactly the same and so it makes it really hard to to look at sources and, and know which ones you can trust, visually speaking. And, and you add to that the fact that most of us react to titles. When we're, on, when we're on our social media feed, we only see the title or we read one paragraph or whatever the case is. So we don't even have, the, we're not necessarily trained to examine all those sources and to know where it's coming from. So yeah, that is a big issue. All right, we have Paul over there. And then we have Alex after Paul. Hi, Paul. Pastor Mike's ministering right now, so this is great. Yeah. Uh, John, could you just uh, enlighten us on what you mean by, Kelly talked about things being equal time. What did you mean by the term flattened? So vi I'm, an, I'm a graphic designer. So um, visually, uh, when you looked at a, the, the fact that someone had the competence to print a newspaper and then you trusted that design gave you some, some signals. So if you were a conservative person in New York City, you would take the Wall Street Journal or the New York Post and you would know, that's my newspaper, you know? And um, even early web design also it sort of worked that way because if you were to go on to a conspiracy theory website, it would look really bad. And even if you're not a designer, you would know kind of instinctually, this may not be as trustworthy. Facebook has this UI way that they, they present content where every link looks exactly the same. And I even believe that they have embedded stories too. So when you click on it, it, it looks the same as well. And like you said, we're only reading headlines. So they all look the same. It used to be you go on a website, oh, I know what the, this is, I can't trust this, or it may give you a clue to something. Whereas now I think um, everything looks the same. And so it, you've lost sort of that, that knowing, oh, you had trusted sources, and even after that you had instincts of, oh, I don't trust that. It's all the same, so it's hard to, it makes yeah. it harder to, to filter out what you can and can't trust. And another thing quickly to that, and then we'll get to Alex, is if you go to the grocery store and you look at the magazine aisle, and what do you have? You have the National Enquirer that's black and white. So you clearly see a distinction between the, those magazines and the ones that are in color. But then you'll still have Cosmo right next to, you know, these other magazines. They're all, some of our put on an equal playing ground and we, we have to learn to discern between them. I think one of the other things that censorship poses as a danger to society is that it limits the amount of growth that's available for people. So like you guys were saying, um, the lack of expression that people feel due to the one narrative controlling, um, with the one entity controlling the narrative. And uh, when we limit the amount of communication between both sides, we not only limit you know, the growth that people themselves experience, but we limit um, people's ability to converse with one another in a less hostile way. Yeah. Because obviously when um, a majority of people uh, are being fed into this idea that their narrative is correct, um, they're not going to approach other people with uh, kindness and lovingness. Instead, they're going to approach them with hostility. So if we were to open up that communication between those people, they're able to have a more um, effective and mature conversation with one another. Yeah, and following up with that, I'm just going to give a plug for C3. That's why we do this. Because we, we have a gatekeeper, whoever's a facilitator, keeping a safe environment for ideas to be expressed where people are, are going to be loved through that process. I have a, another pertinent passage. Um, so uh, another verse in Proverbs 18, 
Uh, an intelligent heart acquires knowledge, and the ear of the wise seeks knowledge. And so one of the dangers of censorship um, when I read this passage is that when you, I think it creates a little bit of laziness within us. If we, uh, if the information is taken down and we just start trusting whoever is taking down the information. But I think as if the information is out there and we have a critical eye, um, we can we can seek out the truth and asking God for wisdom. Um, I, I think now more than ever, we need to actually exercise those critical thinking muscles because we have so much information that's thrown at us. And because um, before we didn't, like, we have like a global network now of information. And I honestly think we have too much information and it's a lot for people to not just mentally consume, but emotionally consume. And um, for me, just censoring myself, and there have been things I'm like, I can't, I can't watch this anymore, or I can't look at this information anymore, because um, for me, it, there's something in my spirit, or the spirit within me, that's just like, this isn't right. I can't, I don't know why, but um, I think one of the cool things that we as Christians can do is really ask for wisdom from the spirit to really help us um, suss out the truth and figure out what, what is going on. And I think we can have peace in the midst of this information age. Sorry, you used the magical word of the day from a, yeah, the word sussing. <laughs> shout, back, shout back to the women's, uh, was it women's tea? Was it sussing? Yeah. Um, we're going to do a bit of a lightning round because I want to be faithful to time. And so uh, you'll notice that this side of the board is very filled, and this side of the board, it needs to be filled. So uh, we're going to skip over the fourth question, though I will argue the fourth question is one of the most critical questions. So once again, we ran out of time for the fourth, this, the fourth question, but um, that's why we have these discussions to open that door. So I'm going to throw it open to my panel. What are some biblical passages, pertinent passages that speak to this topic? So I'm thinking of um, sanctify me in the truth, your word is truth, and then also emphasis on the truth, the truth will set you free. So if mm. the truth is suppressed, freedom is also suppressed. Yep. Go for it. So, oh, another one? Jennifer? So I have uh, Ephesians 4, 29. Let no corrupting talk come out of your mouths, but only such as is good for building up, as fits the occasion, that it may give grace to those who hear. Very good. We'll go through our panel, and then we'll get to, we'll get to our congregation. I want to get some of these first. Uh, my beloved husband raised in the first service uh, from Romans how everything is permissible, but not all things are beneficial. And so... Mm -hmm using that as our, our guide for what is appropriate, what is true. You know, through grace, all things are permissible. It, is, it doesn't affect our salvation, but yet, not all things are beneficial. Yeah. Um, I, I found a passage in Titus, Titus chapter 1, 10, and 11, and it comes right after the qualification for elders. Um, but talking about, for there are many who are insubordinate, empty talkers and deceivers, especially those of the circumcision party. They must be silenced, since they are upsetting whole families by teaching for shameful gain what they ought not to teach. Yeah. All right, we had some, uh, some people in our congregation. Uh, yeah, I have James 3, 6. And the tongue is a fire, a world of unrighteousness. The tongue is set among our members, staining the whole body, setting on fire the entire course of life, and set on fire by hell. Yeah, and I would, I would include in today's day and age the fingers, because we're typing as well. Ben, is, is your, yeah, Ben, yep. All right, Proverbs eleven twenty two. like a gold ring and a pig snout is a beautiful woman who shows no discretion. <laughs> <laughs> or a beautiful man with no discretion. Yeah. Yeah. What was the verse again? Two? 22. 22. Okay. Uh, this kind of pertains to question number four that we didn't have time to cover, but uh, uh, Proverbs eleven fourteen. but in abundance of counselors there is victory, 
Proverbs 12, 20, but counselors of peace have joy. Proverbs 15, 22, without consultation plans are frustrated, but with many counselors they succeed. I'm so we theme. limit, when we limit through censorship, whoever has that power, without getting the discussion as the panel was saying, you know, we, it's, a, it's, a, it's against what the Bible shares. Yeah, for sure. I see, Mike, is your hand up and back? We'll take one more, and then for the sake of time, we're gonna, we're gonna move on. Proverbs 18, oh, 21, we'll take, sorry. the tongue has the power of life and death. Words yeah. are, Proverbs. The stakes are high. Proverbs 18 seem, sure seems to have a lot of this on this topic, so an excellent chapter. And then, um, sorry, Mike, well, I, can we get uh, Mike McFarland as well? I was thinking of 1 Corinthians 9, specifically where mm -hmm. Paul is talking about laying down his own rights in this, and he does it specifically to, in regards to his own witness on here, and it makes me think about on this, how often are we as Christians, and in particularly American Christians, are we so protective of this is my right to have my freedom of speech and everything, but instead we might have to stop to think, do I need to censor myself to put this down for the sake of my own witness for Christ? Amen. Amen. Well, that's going to be a great segue to where we're going from this. But before we do that, I want to say a thank you. Can we give a round of applause to our panel? Thank you, guys. Um, and, and similarly, I want to say thank you to all of you um, for, for your thoughts as well. I love this. This is a taste of what C3 looks like uh, on a weekly basis. So if you've enjoyed this conversation, I would encourage you, make it a priority to come at 11 o'clock. Here's the cool thing about C3. We have, we have it on, we're gonna be on Zoom at the same time as we're in person. So for those of you who are watching on, online, you can tune in through our virtual resources hub next week at 11 o'clock. You can be a part of this as well. But we do have, we still have a sermon and you're looking at the clock saying, how's this gonna work? It's a quick one, it's a quick one, okay? The last five minutes of every C3 discussion are always reserved for our facilitator to draw it all home and say, what does God have to say about this? Because you've heard a lot of opinions, and I, I thought they were phenomenal opinions, but at the end of the day, the most important opinion is God's. And what does scripture say? Well, we've got a lot of this. I want to add one to the list. I'm going to ask you to open your Bibles to 1 Timothy chapter 1. We're going to be looking at verses 3 through 7. 1 Timothy chapter 1, verses 3 through 7. This is what Paul says. As I urged you when I was going to Macedonia, remain at Ephesus so that you may charge certain persons not to teach any different doctrine, nor to devote themselves to myths and endless genealogies, which promote speculations rather than the stewardship that is from God that is by faith. The aim of our charge is love that issues from a pure heart and a good conscience and a sincere faith. Certain persons, by swerving from these, have wandered away into vain discussion, desiring to be teachers of the law without understanding either what they're saying or the things about which they make confident assertions. Our takeaway, our main, our main point for today, is that we need to learn to censor ourselves. And this was some, one of the things that came out. We asked the question, who has the power to censor? Let us begin by learning to censor what we say and the, the ways in which we approach. So the title for today is Censoring Ourselves. And I have three very quick points. Don't worry, they're very quick points. To begin, I want to give you some context. The Apostle Paul takes his protege in this book, in 1 Timothy, his protege Timothy, and he says to Timothy, when I put you in charge of Ephesus, I gave you two things to do, and I want to remind you of that. Number one, I told you to censor or silence certain false teachers who are teaching wrong doctrines. You know, as a church, we're not just going to let anybody on stage and preach from the Word of God. We want to make sure that they're preaching, what they're preaching is in accordance with sound doctrine, which you'll see in 1 Timothy and Titus, 2 Timothy as well. He says you need, you need to silence these men. It came up in the Titus passage that, that uh, my wife brought up. But in addition, he says you need to be careful about the kind of conversations you're having. 
because he says, he says to stay away from myths, endless genealogies, which promote vain talk or speculations rather than the stewardship from God that is by faith. And he said, you know, one of the things that can happen when we have discussions like these, if we're not careful, is that we can get caught up in debating and get caught up in discussions that are not filtered through the gospel. And what we're told is we need to censor everything and filter everything through the gospel of Jesus Christ. In fact, that word that he uses, the stewardship, the word in Greek literally is economy. And, he, and when Paul uses it, he's talking about the ministry that God entrusted to him as a minister of the gospel. And Paul says, that has been passed down to you, Timothy. It has been passed down to the church. We must make sure that the gospel is always first and foremost. And one of the things I love about C3 is that in these discussions, we, have, we are always trying to apply scripture and to filter it through the gospel. Well, you might be saying, it seems a little mean for Paul to force somebody to silence teachers. But verse 5 is really our takeaway for today. He says, The aim of our charge is love that issues from a pure heart, a good conscience, and a sincere faith. We must filter and censor our conversations through the lens of love. How often when we debate with people and we have those rough conversations, whether it be on social media, whether it be with our relatives, our friends, our family, when we have those discussions, is our motivation love? Are we striving to love one another more? And you might say, well, how do I know? Well, Paul gives us three takeaways for today. The first one is that when we talk with others, we must examine our motives to see if they are pure. Notice what he says, the aim is, the charge is love that issues from a pure heart. Another word for that is clean heart. How often are our motives impure? Now, if you're a competitive person like me, when I get into debates, I can fall into, I'm gonna beat you, I'm gonna win this debate, you're gonna lose, I'm gonna, you know, I'm gonna win. Or I, I want to be proven right, that's what I'm fighting for. Paul says, no, you need to be fighting for love. How many times have you won a debate or, or, or a discussion, but you didn't do it in a way that was loving to your fellow brother or sister? Paul says you need to te test your motives. Why am I doing this? The second thing is you need to test your conscience. When talking with others, we must examine our conscience to see if we're guilty. He says the goal of this is love that comes from a good conscience. So if you're having a dialogue, if you're having a discussion with somebody and there's this feeling of guilt that is arising, we might call it conviction from the Holy Spirit, you need to stop yourself and say, am I honoring God with this? And maybe you don't get it in the moment, but as many of you know, you have the discussion and then you start analyzing it afterwards and you're like, wow, I can't believe I said that that way. Maybe you need to go back and say, you know what, I'm not, I don't regret what I said, I regret how I said it. Or you know what, I still believe what I said, but I said it wrong. Please forgive me. We need to allow our conscience to be our guide. And then the final thing, when we are talking with others, we must examine our own perspective to see if it is driven by faith. Because notice what he says at the end there. It also comes from a sincere, unhypocritical faith. And I fear that far too often in the discussions that we have, our motives are driven more from fear than they are from faith. Now, to be clear, there is a place for fear in the life of a Christian. Fear has its purpose, but the danger of fear is that we can allow it to encapsulate us and grip us so much that we're no longer acting out of trust in God, in his promises and his character. And in all of these topics that we've discussed, whether it be Black Lives Matter, whether it be the LGBTQ plus movement, whether it be censorship or whatever it is, sometimes we can be prone to act out of fear. And when we act out of fear, it, we're not loving one another. And so we must ask ourselves, is this coming out of a place of trust in God's character and his promises? If you want to learn how to do this, come to C3. This is where we're training us how to have these discussions. But if you can't make it out to C3, I encourage you, as you're engaging in discussions and dialogues, ask yourself, am I, am I censoring what I'm saying? Am I filtering it through the gospel, through love? 
Is my conscience clear? Are my motives pure? And am I doing this based on faith? Let's pray. Father, we are so grateful that you are the God of all wisdom, who leads us in wisdom, who when we ask for wisdom, you promise to give it to us. Lord, help us to interact with one another, whether it be digitally, whether it be in person, whether it be with our family, friends, or complete strangers. Lord, help us to learn to love one another, to speak the truth with boldness but humility, to, to, to take into effect the, the, the perspective of those around us. And God, may we honor you in these discussions when we have them in the future. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. Hey, let's stand together. Let's close with a song. That just... And I will build my life upon your love. It is a firm foundation. I in you alone and I will not sing it again I will build I will build my life upon your love it is a firm foundation I will put my trust in you Every song we could ever sing Worthy of all the praise we could ever bring Worthy of every breath we could ever breathe We live for you For you, Jesus yeah. Jesus, the name above every other name Jesus, the only one who could ever say, worthy of every breath we could ever breathe, we live for you, we live for you. Yeah. Holy, there is no one like you, there is none beside you, open up my eyes in wonder and show me who you are and fill me with your heart and lead me in your love to those around you I will build my life upon your love it is a firm foundation I in you alone and I will not be shaken I will build my life upon what you love it's a firm foundation I will put my trust in One of the things that we do not do when we become a Christian is turn off our minds. We, it says in God's word that we're to love God with all of our heart, soul, mind, and strength. And as Christians, we need to learn to encapsulate all of life through the lens of his gospel, through the lens of love, through the lens of God's word. 
I hope you guys have been blessed today, and I encourage you to come out next week, 11 o'clock, to, to see three as an opportunity to continue to grow in this area. And even as you're engaging with one another, do so out of love. Do so to honor God in whatever you do, whether in word or deed. Now, our elders are going to be available after the service. If you need prayer, we love to pray for you. We love to be able to just seek God on your behalf. So be, be able to come up front. If, if Yeah, come, come up front. The elders will be able to pray for you. But for this week and forever, be strong in God's grace.